Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards, and in this lesson, number 160, we'll continue our journey by taking a look at the microkernel architecture style. You can get a listing of all of the lessons that I do on Software Architecture Monday by going to my website at developer2architect.com slash lessons. Here you can actually well, see a description of the lesson. You can also view it through the website or uh, you can go to YouTube. In the prior lesson, actually the prior two lessons, I showed you this classification of architecture styles. It's going to act as our roadmap uh, for these groupings of lessons. Uh, last lesson, we'll we took a look at the modular monolith uh, but this lesson, we're going to look at our last monolithic architecture style before <laughs> going into the Wild West and take a look at the microkernel architecture style. So the microkernel architecture style is best described as a single deployment unit. So again, it's monolithic, meaning all of the functionality is deployed as a single unit of software. But unlike the other architecture styles, this one is deployed with independent modular add-on functionality, usually called plugins. As a matter of fact, this is another name. Uh, this has another name uh, from microkernel, which is the formal name. It's also known as the plugin architecture style um, because of the nature of the plugins. If you look around, there's so many examples of the microkernel architecture style. As a matter of fact, one of the best examples I could tell you about is actually Eclipse. Now, back in the day, <laughs> I notice my gray hair, it used to be that we would download Eclipse and it was nothing more than kind of a glorified editor. You could open a file, change a file, save a file. And I'm using Eclipse, but any kind of IDE, integrated development environment. It's not really useful until we start adding plugins to add extensions and capabilities to this. Now, I do kind of pick on Eclipse here and use Eclipse as an example also of what not to do with the microkernel architecture. Did you notice the description, the shape of this? Independent, self-contained plugins. So the problem is if you start sharing plugins as Eclipse does, unfortunately, this creates very unhealthy dependencies because if you remove one plugin or update one, all of a sudden something else breaks because of a version problem. And so this is something to definitely avoid uh, with the microkernel architecture. But there's another really good example of microkernel that you are using right now. And I know that because you're viewing this video, and that is a browser. Something like Chrome, for example, or any browser, uh, it's, it's an HTML renderer, but it could do so much more if you start using add-ons or plugins. I can plug in ASCII doc, I can plug in ASCII doctor into Chrome, and now I've got an authoring platform that I could actually write books on. <laughs> so these are good examples of the microkernel architecture. Uh, PMD, Jenkins, uh, most of the things in a CI CD pipeline are also microkernel. Anything that you can write your own plugins or purchase third party plugins for is, in fact, usually the microkernel architecture style. But it's not limited to just tools. We can also have, for example, tax software, uh, where each form, for example, in the US where I live, we have all these forms and worksheets, uh, could be represented by a particular plugin. Uh, uh, claims processing within an insurance company is another good example uh, where each plugin contains the specific rules for that jurisdiction. When we look at the microkernel, and this now we're going to start to see some similarities uh, with the modular monolith, it just has a different structure. Those plugins can actually be in the form of jar files or DLLs or gems or packages external. Uh, so that all that functionality, for example, let's say we're assessing devices like iPhones <laughs> or any electronic device, uh, would have its own jar file or own DLL that would then be kind of plugged in. A lot of the tools I mentioned in the last lesson with the modular monolith, uh, those things like Java modularity, uh, Penrose, Jigsaw, Prism, 
uh, all of these kind of tools or frameworks uh, are used OSGI um, to help manage uh, plugins. But like the modular monolith, we don't have to use those tools. It doesn't have to be that complex because those plugins can actually be part of the single code base. So in other words, this is our entire deployment unit, and it's consisting of one uh, single Git repository, for example. Here, however, uh, we would delineate a plugin in our code base through the namespace package structure or directory structure. For example, uh, notice here, I've got two examples. Here's all the assessment rules for an iPhone. Uh, here are all the assessment rules for an iPad. Notice though, we utilize the directory structure, which then becomes manifested through a namespace or a package structure, for example, to denote that this is a special area of code. These are plugins. They shouldn't communicate with one another. What kind of plugin? Well, it's an assessment for what? An iPad 4. And that's where our class files would actually reside. And those are all represented right here. And so this is another way of implementing or designing a microkernel architecture, uh, avoiding a lot of those frameworks. Now, the trade-off here is the simplicity. But if I make a change to a plugin, unfortunately, I have to redeploy the entire system. Whereas if it is modular using like, let's say a jar file or a DLL or a gem, uh, then in that case, I can utilize those tools. Uh, so I don't have to restart the application. Uh, these vary greatly. I'm sure you've, well, <laughs> way in the past, uh, you've been told, uh, drop this file into this directory and restart the application. That's not a good example of the microkernel architecture from an implementation standpoint. Okay, that's microkernel. Um, it does have a lot more strengths than the others, and we're starting to see this now, where cost, evolvability, interoperability, and simplicity are its real strong points. And the times to use and choose the microkernel architecture are those times when most of our change is in fact isolated to uh, these independent plugins. Uh, that way the core system really represents kind of general business rules. And what we try to do with the microkernel architecture is apply all of our change and put it outside of that core system. And this is a really good use case uh, for the microkernel architecture. Also, if we've got a kind of a system or an application or a product that has multiple configurations, uh, the microkernel architecture matches that shape perfectly. So configurability or customizability is one of the strengths here of a microkernel architecture. Uh, those uh, examples where let's say we have uh, poly cloud environments uh, where sometimes we deploy to Azure, sometimes we deploy to uh, GCP, sometimes it's AWS. Uh, the core system doesn't change, but those plugins can represent abstractions to those particular services, which do differ in each of those. So our code, here doesn't change. The plugins act as adapters to those external services. And this is another really good use case uh, for the microkernel. Also, quite frankly, if you do have the type of system or the type of business problem where you expect end users or even just uh, third parties to add functionality, those are plugins. So these are really good use cases where there's a good alignment and good use of the microkernel architecture. But like all of them, there are times to avoid this. And with the microkernel, uh, this mostly involves uh, a lot of the operational type of things. For example, high levels of elasticity or scalability, uh, fault tolerance. Um, now, it's interesting, you might say, but Mark, I'm, I'm a little curious here because um, can't I remove bottlenecks and increase scalability uh, by even if I made these remote? I could do that with the microkernel as well. Of course, now we're talking about a distributed architecture that brings in a lot of other <laughs> different kinds of star ratings and trade-offs. But the point is, it's still 
all requests have to come into the core system. And this creates a bottleneck for elasticity and scalability, even though we have kind of a modular kind of architectural style. The same is true with fault tolerance. Uh, if I crash on a plugin, uh, that core system uh, still has to get to that functionality. So, uh, and also if that core system crashes, um, all functionality is gone. Um, but there's another kind of use case when to sometimes avoid this. And that is if most or all of our changes are isolated into that core system. Uh, what this means is that we're going to be continually doing redeployments and retesting of the entire monolithic system. And uh, that can get quite expensive. Uh, now, I say this is times to avoid if that is one of the driving forces of being able to use and choose the microkernel architecture. In other words, we're choosing use microkernel to push all changes out to those plugins. But if we find that we're still ch constantly changing the core system, uh, there are other architecture styles that are probably better suited, and we'll actually see those. All right, so that is the microkernel architecture along with uh, some of the star ratings. You'll notice right here, I just want to point out uh, that that whole maintainability, testability, and deployability, isn't it interesting? We've gone through three architecture styles so far, and several weeks back, <laughs> we did take a look at the layered, which only had one star for these. Modular Monolith added an additional star. There's now a third star. So we're starting to get better in terms of that agility because if a change is isolated to the plugin, that's the only thing I need to test and possibly deploy. And so this actually starts increasing that maintainability, testability, deployability aspect of an architecture a little more. So, um, and the same thing, you know, performance, interoperability, and evolvability now has three stars as opposed to just one uh, because, well, by adding plugins, we actually do evolve uh, the architecture. Okay, well, this has been lesson 160, uh, the microkernel architecture. Uh, stay tuned in two more weeks for our next lesson, 161, where we'll bounce into the distributed world and take a look at five different architectures, starting with microservices. So anyways, and we'll follow the same kind of pattern. We'll, I'll talk a little bit about the topology, some interesting aspects of it. Take a look at when to use and when not to use these architectures. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, stay tuned in two more weeks.